Welcome to the Nia Judge Home Podcast. My name is Isaac Kamins. This is a bi-weekly podcast where my friend Jess O'Brien and I discuss internal martial arts, qigong, and meditation. Uh, this week we complete our discussion on the Xingyi Master Shang Young Shang. Uh, we talk a bit more about Shang's later life. Uh, and then we look at an account by one of his students of what it was like training with Shang. Uh, and compare that to some of the stuff we've done. Then at the end of the episode, we discussed uh, Dissolving Nagong. We talked a lot about Dissolving in the first season, so if you haven't listened to the first season, you may want to go back and revisit some of that. Uh, then we I do a short little session at the end just to give people a taste of what Dissolving is like. Uh, again, these are just meant to give people an idea of what we're talking about, not to really teach you how to do it. And finally, check out our Patreon for interviews and some shingy lessons and a few other things that will be up. Uh, this week, we put up our interview with Jamie Dibden, so you should absolutely check that out. All right, well, thanks for listening, and enjoy the episode. Welcome back to the Nature Twin Podcast with Isaac and Jess. We're continuing our journey here in season two, discovering a second generation of teachers, the, the teachers of Grandmaster Leo Hung Jae, and exploring some of the martial arts masters of the 1800s and early 20th century. Um, today, we're going to talk more about Master Shang Yun Xiang, who was the part of the lineage of Xingyi masters that goes to Grandmaster Leo Hung Jae. And uh, Master Shang's well known for you know, being a brawler and a shingy sort of reputation maker back around the turn of the century. Um, so we'll begin with something from uh, an internet site. Shang style shingy trend was founded by Grandmaster Shang Yun Xiang, who lived from 1864 to 1937. He inherited the famous nickname Unbeatable Half Step Bung Chuan from his Grandmaster Guo Yun Shen. So that's one of his nicknames, as well as Iron Foot Buddha, like we talked about last time. So he inherited the nickname, right? So ah. it, was, it was Guo's nickname first. It's like a, it's like a right. professional wrestler type thing. You right. Know? Like. Got it from the last guy. <laughs> Unbeatable half step. So, I mean, as we talked about before, Bung Chun is one of the best techniques from Xing Yi that's definitely very versatile and very strong way of just punching hard. Yeah, and uh, so it's unbeatable. Thing. So that's his, his crushing fist was unbeatable. That's pretty cool. He lived to be 73 years old. So here's one of the things about Shang's bio. Shang was an inspector with the military of five different cities and became the head of house security for the Qing court eunuch and area military commander in chief, Li. Um, so it sounds like he's, he's working with government officials and he's a security worker for one of the big time eunuchs in the court. He was known for his small limbs and big belly. His belly was said to have shown legendary strength. Many boxers supposedly broke their wrists by punching him in the stomach. So that story keeps going around about something about that big belly Xing Yi guy. Yep. That can be a formidable opponent. <laughs> for sure. You know, think of Master Hung Shang from Taiwan. He was known for being huge. And Wang Shujing in Taiwan as well. Big fat bellies with big, hard punching. It's like I said. It, it's like I said last time. It, Xing Yi kind of. It lends itself to do it, you, you, you know, the art works well with a large frame. Right. In, in a lot of martial arts, being big can be a hindrance, you know, it can make it harder to do the movements. And Shingy being so. large it doesn't particularly hinder you from doing it. That's all. It's not, that's it's all not very saying. fancy, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't have a lot of like, you know, there's not a lot of jumps or high kicks or, you know, I mean, it's fairly you know, low to the ground and fairly about being stable. And, you know, like I said, it lends itself to large frame. It doesn't mean it only works for a large frame. Right. So talking about his uh, history briefly, he obtained his Xing Yi skills from the, from the even higher level teacher, Li Tsun Yi, famous uh, for his broadsword skills. Um, and so after that, when he was older, he learned Bagua Zhang, from Cheng Tinghua as well, Li Tsun Yi's friend, who is a Bagua master. Shang was well known for his skill with Bung Chuan, one of the five basic skills of Xing Yi. Because he was skilled in combat, another grandmaster, Guo Yanshen, visited him personally to instruct him on Bung Chuan methods. Um, and here, Guo Yanshen passes away in 1901, uh, so you know one year after the Boxer Rebellion. So he's he's a much older generation teacher 
But that sounds like he kind of polished off his education by giving him this specialization in bunk training. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like, you know, if you got a chance to study with Master Guo, I'd jump at it. Right. So one other little thing of his bio here. Shang's career had always been related to martial arts. He had worked as a Biao Tuo, head man of a Biao Ju, which is an establishment which provides services such as escorts, bodyguards, transporters of goods, armed escorting, bodyguards, detectives, martial arts, and so on. Um, so it sounds like he was in the security business, you know, at the turn of the century in Beijing. So that was a very popular, needed, and uh, you get a lot of ex- a lot of actual experience fighting in that trade at that time. Yeah, I think I mean, especially at that time, it was one of the few things that a martial artist could do. You know, where you could use your martial arts to make money. Um, so, you know. As opposed to having like a flower shop or, you know, something right. where you had to do something else for money. And- right. Or glasses shop. So here, uh, now moving to a different website where we found one of the students of Shang had uh, made some notes um, about a couple of the ways of training. Um, one thing he says is that Hung, that Master Shang said that Hong Jin is the foundation for delving deeply into the Xing Yi state system. As stated in the Xing Yi classic, Five elements are the mother of Xing Yi, and Hung is the mother of the five elements. Hung being the earth element fist, which is the, the fifth of the five elements, and is often credited as being kind of the main technique from which all the others are derived. So looking forward a little bit at the training of, of Hung element, um, I'm taking from this article by Li Zhang Chen. Uh, and so he says... The first thing Shang made him change was the Hong Jin in his body. He had to make it more subtle and not wrap and extend so much. This, and just trained simple back and forth stepping and extension and retraction of the hands. So he made him uh, just just go back to like sticking his arms back out without twisting really hard. Um, sort of like making him go back in his training. Further, he had to turn his ankles awkwardly open 180 degrees, which felt as if being stuffed in a pocket, impossible to exert force in any part of the body. If he tried to use gene energy, he would end up falling, let alone standing upright with a straight back. After training with Shang Yung Chung for a while, his whole body felt awkward and every movement became difficult, like a kid having to relearn how to walk. And when he talks about this turning of the ankles really wide open, that reminds me a little bit about the stepping method of the way Hung Chuan is done in this system, where you take uh, a somewhat different type of steps across your body than other styles that I've seen that's a little more complex. And there's a sort of opening of the of the ankles like he's talking about here a little bit. That's an impression I get. Yeah, I mean, it's way fucking hard to explain. But um, the method of stepping that they're talking about is where when you take a step, you if your left foot is forward when you start, your left foot's going to cross your body, go to the right side of yeah. your of where you were standing, but you're not going to cross your legs. Your body sort of turns as you go. That gets your foot over there. And then as you come sort of onto that leg, your body follows it and you end up in this sort of that, that classic hung train position. Right. Uh, it's hard to describe in words. It's, it's impossible to describe. It's, it's, it's hard to show people in person, let alone describe. that experience but, of feeling awkward. It rings a bell. Cause but when it is a, learned this, it, it's like, Oh my God. It is a very awkward step because the way you have to turn your body in the middle of it. Um, this is the method that Wang Shijing used. Uh, this is the method that Liu Hongjie used. And it, it, it differs from a lot of Xing Yi where they essentially use the same step in Pao Chen and in Hong Chen. So they, they use the classic seven star stepping sort of a back and forth zigzag step as opposed to this sort of weird crossing over step and then coming right back. you end up in the same place but it's a different type of stepping so it at first it felt super awkward but then gradually his walking posture changed to become very soft and lazy very much like shan yun Xian. at this point training the forms felt empty loose natural so i mean it sounds, you know, once again, the teacher makes the student relearn everything his way. And at first it's really hard, but then over time, I, I like his term empty, loose, and natural. That's the kind of Xing Yi that I like to train. That's not super rigid, but it's smooth. A lot of Xing Yi has 
almost a Shaolin type of feel where there's a lot of expression of power at the end of the technique. The stomping and the explosions. Yeah, and like the, the sort of snap with the arms at the end. And um, this particular style of Xing Yi, it doesn't have that. It, it, it ha um, I think it's most obvious in his the way that they do um John Chen where they they there's a there's a rollback to it right so rather than from the the starting position just stepping straight out the foot comes back first the arm sort of hooks to the side then you step out and shift your weight forward so it's a bit like the tai chi technique of rollback um that particular thing, I'm not sure where Shang picked it up. It could have been from Guo Shen. It could have been from Li Sun Yi. It could have been something he kind of adapted from learning Bagua. Because uh, to me, it looks a lot like the uh, the sort of teacup exercise from Bagua. If you did it in a straight line, um, where you curl your hand under your elbow and then hook it around in a circle. Um, so, you know who knows where he got it but that but that characteristic is i mean nobody you know at least that i've ever seen outside of the that particular lineage does the john chen the technique that way it's that's like a it's a dead giveaway of of that particular style so um i don't think he had the same kind of like um uh, snappy power to it that was it was more of a flowy the kind of thing a bit more like bagua or tai chi so we're looking again at this article by one of shang's students li jong shuen and he said he starts to talk about p trend here um the first exercise of of xing yi when one first learns p trend one should find an open and wide training space when a man climbs a high mountain once his field of vision opens he feels as if he just has made a long exhalation in a spacious place it is easier to breathe freely well, that's and that's kind of interesting. Yeah, well, and that has to do with metal, the metal element. So the two places in nature where the element of metal is the strongest are uh, large deposits of ore, so mountains, and large open spaces, uh, plains, things like that, where you have lots of open air because it's the lungs, right? So, you know practice outdoors is good for you you know yeah you and it, it gets your mind expanding a little bit i've heard teachers talk about that yeah. of, of experiencing different spaces get your mind in a different zone kind I mean, of shingy is essentially a five element practice so being around those elements you know does kind of amplify the element so there's some small benefit to doing you know you can't uh fire's tricky because unless you can <clears throat> get near a uh sort of like a blacksmith's you know furnace or something or uh near a volcano it's hard to come by but uh the you know uh the like water's pretty easy wood's pretty easy you know so you can you know you can hang out with At trees least, yeah around here <clears throat> yeah so you know it just depends but that but that that is a sort of vein in shingy of about you know using the elements and right some people definitely uh, are into yeah, it you know. So looking, he talks about the first phase of learning Xing Yi, of uh, learning Pichun. The breathing becomes long and prolonged, deeper, and the energy storages are refueled. The movement of the hands stimulate the whole body, and one starts to slowly feel the breath expand, and all of the skin's pores across the entire body open it up. At this stage of training Pichun, you may reach a state in which you feel as if the skin is as thick as an elephant's. One may also feel that the fingers of the hands become thick like carrots, as if there were a and as if there was a vortex at the palms of the hand, which draws the fingers to close of themselves and, quotes, wish to remain closed. That reminds me a little bit of the type of Santi training where you pulse the palms of the body while you stand and breathe. And you do get that. I like that sense of the skin is as thick as an elephant. You know, you feel like something around you just thickens and your whole body's like in a viscous sort of state. When you, when you practice Santi for a any good amount of time one of the first things that happens is you get because of the stretching open of the shoulders and the the, the lengthening of the tissues in the arms and the opening of the joints you get blood flow you get more movement
movement of fluid out to your fingertips. And so you'll get sort of these like that sort of blotchy feeling in your palms. And then that will is followed by an increased awareness of your nerves. Right. So that's a generally a tingling feeling for a lot of people. Right. So you're getting these sort of this awakening happening in your body. And once it sort of smooths out, you finish and you just feel, you know, to me, it was like, you always just sort of feel, I mean, I like the carrot thing. That's pretty funny, but, but you just sort of feel bigger than you normally do. And you're particularly your hands. I mean, it would sometimes feel like you could just, you know, crush a coconut or something to I me mean, because your hands were just so puffy and, you know, full of energy at the end of practice. But, um, feeling like you can do something and actually being able to do it aren't the same thing, by the way. But that's, that, that's an indicator of, of blood flow and energy getting out to your fingertips. And so it's a, uh, you know, positive sign when you practice Santi. So he talks about the next stage. Uh, you're, you start exercising the breath. It takes a year for this Gong Fu to be acquired. It helps eliminate disease and strengthen the body. Through exercising the breath, the chi in the body grows. And a lot of times one would get a feeling of inspiration. He says, first, the body must not learn fighting, meaning that before fighting, one should learn the skill of the body of whipping with the hand and changing the power of the whole body. Otherwise, in a fight, there's, there's, there's no speed. There's no crispness, crispness like that of a cracker snapping in two, and you will surely lose. If the gong fu is not acquired, then the self-training in fighting without the supervision of a teacher can cause damage to the joints. This is why it said, first, the body must not learn fighting. So I interpret that as don't necessarily try to do applications as you train. You Follow the rules of the training, but don't worry about like how you're going to use it right away. It doesn't necessarily help. Well, I don't know. I think that I, I think fighting. I mean, to me, it is, uh, that's a bit more literal, right? Like doing martial arts in a class isn't fighting, right? So I think that that you can f do applications, you can do sure. techniques, um, but you do them slowly, you do them carefully, you do them. Uh, according to the principles of the art right so mm -hmm. um it, I, I think it's it's about doing the basic training which you know some of that is two person but most of it is just learning the the uh you know the nagong aspects of it and, right and, and I, I feel like if for, especially for an inexperienced person if you're putting on gloves to spar for your first time Hey, that's going to stress you out, and that's it's not going to necessarily help you learn this specific Shingy training method right this minute. Right, I mean, you're going to need to do that eventually, but the first yes. thing isn't to go out and just punch it out, and then no, but you know, you'll never remember what you're trying to do at first. Right, but like I said, there's a big, there's a world of difference between sparring and yeah. doing a technique, and I think right. Shingy's Shingy's method is uh, you don't spar much at all what you do is you do a lot of very careful uh very deliberate very uh sort of um by the book application uh, of the technique so that you learn you know you, you your body learns the mechanics of the technique and of the applications but you, you don't put it in a way that clouds your mind, right? So you don't speed up. You don't put a lot of power. Mm. You're just learning how to do the stuff with a smooth mind, right? And it's why it takes longer to learn how to fight with something like Shingy than it does with, with, you know, a lot of other martial arts. Because most martial arts, you're, you know, you're sparring on the first day, right? He's saying, you know, it takes a year. You got to just develop this like mind and this body. And, and once you develop that mind and body, then you can start to, um, you know, to fight. You know. Uh, exactly. So one last thing here from this article. In training, P-Chan is like pushing a mountain. The body pushes slowly, section after section, from back to front. The more exhausting the exercise, the better. That's how good Gong Fu is improved. While training fighting, Pi Chun is like swinging an axe. The mountaineers swing axes to chop wood, just like a whip, with a sudden, clean whipping action. Otherwise, the head of the axe will jam in the wood and would not be able to cut the log in two with one strike. 
So he's talking about that sort of sharp whack that you got to do to like crack a log in half. That's the same as P-Chain. Moving on to the discussion of Nagong principles within the training of martial arts and Qigong. Um, we've been going through the list here and now we've gotten to dissolving, which is a, a whole topic unto itself of going inside your body, relaxing, using your mind to, to really feel deep within uh, various places, very specific places, and then trying to consciously let go of tension and releasing it in there. Um, and, uh, you know, we talked a lot about it in the first season. It's a huge part of opening the energy gates, just like alignments is. Um, it's great. And I, again, just like alignments, it's one of the really key things that stands out about this method of Qigong. The dissolving is, is highly emphasized. And a lot of schools may have some discussion of becoming relaxed or soft, but this this step by step dissolving inside yourself in different directions from side to side up to down, even outside yourself, even in interaction with other people, it's a very extensive study. And but at the same time, it's pretty profound. You relax from something that's hard and it melts to something that's liquid and it releases either into space inwardly or outwardly into gas is the metaphor the sort of standard thing that gets done in a lot of nagong as the basic kind of practice is a you know the microcosmic orbit type of stuff where you're circulating energy in this particular system the d dissolving is the primary method to get from where you are to where you're going is to dissolve right so like you can be doing other things but the thing that's going to sort of be continuous through that is this sense of relaxing and letting go and that's all it is i mean we we call it dissolving because that's what bruce calls it but you know essentially it's the process of you know feeling a, a place in your body that is blocked and letting your mind just sit with that place and relax it until that thing lets go but that's only the the, the middle stage right that's where most people i don't say most people where a lot of people stop is okay i got the thing to relax it feels better i can move on but there's a there's another stage of this practice where you go ice to water water to gas where the, the, the sense of something being stiff releases that's ice to water. But then the sense of that thing that's released going a step further to just completely letting go and letting it sort of dissipate. That's this water to gas, right? So um, he, the classic example is you clench your fist, right? As hard as you can. That's ice. You relax your fist, but it's still a fist. That's water. And then you relax your hand even more till it opens. That's water to gas. And that's the, that, that ability to do that, you know, with your mind alone. That's the practice. That's what takes years and years and years to develop. But that concept of recognizing tension relaxing it and letting it go essentially is the basic like i said it's the basis for the martial arts the meditation the qigong all of it because it's the it's the method by which you let go of of tension of of a not even just tension it, tension's a bad word blocks like because a blockage could be something that isn't tension tension is just the most sort of obvious one right um so it's, it's any sort of blockage, not just attention. Um. One thing that stood out to me when, when I was first learning dissolving and working with you is that it's not just standing and dissolving. It's actually during cloud hands. It's during the swings. It's eventually into your solo forms. Not only that, you start dissolving when you do Rosho or push hands. If you can keep it up during those difficult, even more, you know, more complex movements, it's really it really ex can expand your mind and your ability to feel and your ability to stay connected and as uh, more pro as you progressively test it and make it more difficult all the way to free sparring it becomes more and more how would you say burned into your system 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't recommend trying to do the practice of ice to water, water to gas while you're fighting. Um, but <laughs> by then, it better be built into your system from the right know, easier ways. That you do it. The, the the idea is that you do it enough. It's just like opening, closing, or any of these internal skills that you do it enough that breathing, for example. If you practice it enough by itself, it starts to become a habit, right? And then when you're under pressure, you continue to do it because it's become your natural state, right? So it's not that during a fight, you're going to close your eyes and you're going to feel the energy gate in your shoulder relax and that somehow magically that's going to make your hand right. move faster. No, that's completely. It's got to bleed into the two person right. practices. It's the, the, right. But the practice of dissolving, you know, if you do it an hour a day, it gives you an ability to release tension in your body so that when somebody pushes on you, you have the ability in an instant to release that pressure and return with something that's not tense but you're not consciously dissolving it's sort of like you're not consciously breathing but if you practice breathing enough you'll still be breathing deeply in your belly right so mm. all of these skills they have to be learned and they have to be drilled ad nauseum before they're going to become natural i mean the, the idea that it's going to take you a couple of months or a year to make these things where you can use them in martial arts is fucking ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and yet, if you relax just a little bit, man, that's going to help you when you right. get out there and swing. For sure. You know? but, Every but little bit counts. But relaxing is not dissolving. And I mean, there are practices where you do things, like you say, where you dissolve not just yourself, but the other person doing things like push hands. and But, but that's, a, that's a bridge to something else. And that's a practice that takes a really long time to get good at. It's not something you, I mean, <laughs> like it, it, it's the equivalent of learning how to be a, uh, an energy healer, right? To where you can move energy through someone else's body. So right. again, this isn't about, you know, you're not going to do this in a fight. It's about training your sensitivity, training your abilities. So that just like you said, a little bit of it bleeds over into the, uh, you know, real time kind of situations because exactly. that it's just, you know, that little bit goes yeah. a long way. Right. And I, one thing that stands out to me is that sense of say you have been doing a bunch of sparring and you've been taking hits and hitting other people. And afterward, if you take the time to do a little dissolving, it can actually be a real boost. To, uh, you, you find that you were unconsciously clenching an area yeah. from getting punched. If you dissolve that and you unclench that, boom, it's that instead of getting stuck there for months to come, you're able to release that on the spot and then that, absorb that, that stuck energy on the spot. So it can be that's really a, useful that way. Yeah, that's a far more uh, v useful, valuable goal than <laughs> trying to think about doing it. Like, don't try to do it while you're At fighting <laughs> well, yeah do it but but doing because before and after because the the debate about whether or not it helps you during the fight that who knows that that takes you know that would take a, a level of study that no one's ever even fucking thought about doing but the the idea that fighting creates a a, a certain type of energy in your body and that releasing that energy afterward is good this is something almost anybody can agree on because the hardest thing about learning to fight is turning it off, right? Mm -hmm. That when you're in that mode of, you know, something comes at me, I break it. You can't like go into other situations with that attitude. It mm -hmm. doesn't work. <laughs> so you have to be able to turn it off. And the dissolving practice is one of the main ways you learn how to A, to turn it on, but B, to turn it off. And I think that's, you know, when, if you want to talk about the, the, the value of these practices in fighting, it's not during the fight, it's before the fight and after the fight during the yeah. fight that, you know, as they say, that one's, you know, that one's up to God, like who the fuck knows what's going to happen during the fight? Because, you know, fights are these, uh, these chaos events that nobody can predict how they go. I mean, 
You can take the best professional fighter against the worst fucking drunk, you know, uh, in a bar fight. They got about even odds, you know. You put them in the yeah. ring, you know. You put them in the ring. The 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 you know the trained fighter has a much greater odds. But but it but but who you in know any life, you never know, man. any fucking thing can happen in fighting. So <clears throat> the 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 practice is to to learn how to deal with the build up to it and the you know aftermath of it you know the mm. <clears throat> you're dissolving on the way in so that you don't necessarily have a conflict that you don't necessarily ha have to have you know well that's the ultimate right if you can dissolve the conflict before it happens that's the highest level of martial arts right but <clears throat> you know if you're going to have the conflict have the conflict to deal with the consequences afterward don't try to like you know be some you know monk in the middle of it and you know <laughs> wait you know it's just that's like not gonna, you're gonna work get clocked. yeah you're gonna get clobbered you know and, and yeah so you know i think that's where it's really important to understand you know the how the the nagong training affects these things but it also has limited it has very real limitations in real time uh because you know life isn't the same when you're standing in a room by yourself versus you know, when someone's swinging a baseball bat at your head. Exactly. And that's why I've always appreciated his approach in the energy gate system of first you do it while you're not moving. Then you move really slowly and carefully. Then you move with a little more abandon in the swings. And, and the whole time you continue your dissolving progressively more difficult with each of the more difficult swings. And then again, taking it into two person is, is yet a whole nother you know, level of difficulty, a whole nother exponential level of difficulty. But at each one, whatever dissolving you can do is going to help smooth the process and help it stick to you better and definitely works. Taking it into things, like you said, doing movement practices is one of the um, best ways to, you know, if you're feeling stuck in a, in a movement practice, right? If you start to go through your body and feel how different parts of your body are, stuck or tense or whatever the you know glitch is and you can somehow release a little bit of that glitch over time you might be able to you know work out the glitch it's going to happen faster if you have a teacher or somebody who can help you but if you don't have that you know i mean i think that's the thing these these sort of internal practices they they were designed to be done you know sort of with a teacher but they also have this built-in sort of self-correction mechanism where it's like if you don't have a teacher at least well you do have you know your uh own self awareness of you know your sensitivity what, yeah, yeah that's, and so that's you're going to be your guide in the long run either way right your right. teacher can't do it for you forever so exactly so you might as like, well get started now figuring it yeah, out because exactly. it's going to be on you in the long run yeah for sure all right, partner. All right, man. Great to catch up, man. Yep. Cheers. Bye. Nagong practice session for dissolving. Uh, this can be done standing still. This can also be done moving in a simple movement like cloud hands or the commencement of Tai Chi. Uh, the first thing you're going to want to do is just feel your body and try to align yourself so that nothing feels like it's leaning forward or back nothing's collapsing so your head is over your shoulders your chest is relaxed your belly's relaxed your spine is straight tailbone is slightly tucked if you're moving or going to move you want to make sure that you have a sense of the tucking of your tailbone going all the way to your feet And then you want to begin <clears throat> feeling down your body from the top of your head and beginning to let any sense of tension or strength or weakness or any sensation, especially if you don't have a name for it, you just let your mind feel it. You let your mind sit with it until it begins to soften, to 
begins to have a shape, right? So at first it will just be a chunk, like a block. Then it will start to have a boundary, right? It will You'll feel how it connects to the things around it. You feel the shape of it. You'll feel the the the, the flow and how it, how it moves around if you try to push on it, right? It's like when you massage a muscle and at first you can kind of feel it and then it, it like slips and it gets away from you and you got to wiggle your finger around to find the spot again. It's the same sort of thing here. And you keep going, keep letting that thing relax. And at a certain point, it will start to let go. It will start to release. That sense of relaxation will just continue to the point of dissolving into space, to gas, to nothingness, right? So that as your mind lets go of the tension, the strength, the weakness, the fill in the blank, there is a space created by that release. And inside of this space, you start to feel openness, right? That's the opening part. So you, you, you're you releasing tension and strength and all these other things to discover space inside your body, right? And that's the, the main practice. So as you move, if you're doing cloud hands or something, you're trying to move in a way that no part of your body feels contracted or constricted or unable to move, you know, smoothly and i.e. doesn't have any space. If you're standing still, you have less, you know, parts moving, but it's a little bit harder to tell if some things are uh, out of alignment or, or because you're not it's not moving so you can just but as you begin to feel and you begin to dissolve you'll notice if something is slightly out of alignment you can change it if you're moving it's constantly changing anyway so you have to be a little bit more aware of it and then the final stage you just let everything release let your sense of it being solid go and it just will dissipate away from you and down and mix with the energy around you. And it will come back in its own time. And it just circulates. And so the, the main sort of purpose of this practice is just to have things circulate, right? So the dissolving is a method of releasing a blockage so that something can circulate. So as, as you finish your practice, you want to keep, return to that sense of letting everything first relax and then release. But you want to then go to the sense of being completely quiet and letting it all sort of settle down. Hey folks, Isaac here. Uh, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, check out our Instagram for images and things related to the podcast. Again, like and subscribe. Tell a friend. And thanks for listening. Take care.